And we're back. This is Riders of the Dawn. Yeah, this is Stu. This is Jake. <laughs> As if you can't see us. Yeah. If you're watching this on YouTube. You might be still listening to the podcast, which is great too. Uh, today we're going to talk about what? Malazan, Book of the Fallen. Book of the Fallen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you have not read, or at least attempted to read, the Malazan, Book of the Fallen series, um... I don't know, man. As far as fantasy goes, you're probably... I don't know. You might be living under a rock or just... So far from my demographic, I don't know what to do with you. Yeah. Uh, I I will say that uh, a friend of ours first recommended Malazan, Book of the Fallen, to us. And we both picked it up at the same time. And we both put it down at the same time. Uh, <laughs> which was which was odd because... And, and I'll tell you exactly why. It was... The number of characters in the first volume was so overwhelming that at the pace I was reading it, I couldn't distinguish the characters from one another. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would forget which much. characters were, were which. And so I ended up putting it down because I was so frustrated that I, I was just like, who is this character again? Why, why is this important? Why is this happening? Where's this main character that I'm, I thought I was going to be following from the start? Um, and... That character that I thought was gonna be this character, um, named uh, his name was Perrin. Perrin. Yeah, Perrin yeah, was um, what's what's his last name? Because they end up calling him by his last name the whole time. Uh, I thought it was Ganos. Oh, Ga Ganos. Ganos is his first name. Perrin yeah. is, is his yeah. last name. That's right. And so you you think you're gonna follow this character the whole time, and then you just don't you just don't see him again for a while, and then he comes back, and then you don't see him. For most of the book, after that, so yeah. <laughs> um, you end up following is these other stuff? characters who are in this other city that is going to be be uh, or is in the process of being under siege by the Malazan army, and then these group of mages, this cadre of mages that are, that is a part of the Malazan army. This is the first book, by the way, Gardens of the Moon. Yeah, Gardens of the Moon. So the book, the book actually opens up in a pretty like attention-grabbing kind of way. It, it, it well, it, it opens with, well, it's, it's interesting because it, it doesn't open with like big violence or anything. It opens with a couple of dudes having a conversation on a parapet in, a, mm -hmm. in like a castle. And if, we've mentioned this quote before. He's like, you, you know, if you want to live free, boy, live quietly. But the freest life is the one the gods don't notice. And it's you only realize that it's Whiskey Jack speaking to Perrin much later. Yeah. That like these two have met before and that and that Whiskey Jack gave him this advice and Perrin ignored it. And the whole thing is Perrin ignores the advice and suffers the consequences in that first book. And that's really what that opening scene's about. Yeah. Then you have this opening, then you have the next scene, there they have this besieged city, and there's a cadre of mages, and uh, there's a what 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 we can only think of as like a floating castle, yeah. but it's really not that. Yeah, we only it's, find it's out more sci-fi than that. It turns out. Yeah, but. we only really find out what it is way later in like in one of the later books. There's basically this flying castle called Moonspawn, mm. and out pops one dude and just like annihilates and like half the army, half the army yeah. with magic before like. The, the mages do enough damage to his like castle that he has to like fly away. Yeah. Uh, and so the the castle was like it, you know, just above this besieged city, and then it finally left. And that's your first introduction to Anamanda Rake, who's like a really really important really, central character. Yeah. Not just is he a central character, he's he's one of those paragon characters. He's yeah. a he's essentially a god. Mm -hmm. uh, like he's immortal and he's far beyond like mortal power basically um, and that's your first introduction and, and it's actually a really good device because it it uh, it introduces the magic system in the book which is built around accessing quote warrens mm -hmm. which are these I don't know magic pathways that they're like with magic veins they're like uh, yeah they're like walking walking through another world and they with that I don't want to give any spoilers because it takes a long time for you to really figure out what these warrens are and once you do you're like <laughs> Yeah, it's a cool idea. And uh, but the other great thing about about the series, Stu said, Stu said uh, Animator Rake is basically immortal. But one of the biggest 
selling points to me for the book series was that even the gods die. Yes. Uh, the gods are not immune to... And, and Amanda Rake has, has a god-killing sword. He has a sword that has killed gods. Yeah. He has killed gods with it. And traps their, traps traps their, their souls, souls forever inside, inside the blade. It's basically like... Think of like a Stormbringer, like Mark, Michael Moorcock's Stormbringer. It's, it's basically, you know, I would say it's really derivative of that idea. That there's a, a sword that like hungers for souls. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily hunger for them, but it traps the souls. It eats the souls. Well, and there's there's a reason for that that you find out much later. And there's yeah. actually uh, the sword itself is a warrant. Yeah. Which is this crazy idea, and it's the the people the things that it slays are chained within this warren pulling this giant cart. Yes. And you don't know why they're pulling the cart, but you know that they will they will forever and all eternity pull this cart. Um, <laughs> it's like a hellish... Yeah, it's like it's hell really trapped cool. in a sword, and yeah, it's so cool. cool. Yeah. There's a lot of great imagery, and so one of the reasons that you read this series um, is the is the imagery, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the systems, it's the world, it's the setting, it's the imagery, but the prose especially. Oh, the prose um, is brilliant. It's one of these, you know... Um, The prose is, rare, rarely do I say you can read a book for the prose. And Tolkien is one of those times, and Erickson is another one. The prose really, really reads well. And it's not, um, it's not, it's it's florid and descriptive, and it's got great use of color, and you never see uh, kind of Robert Jordan syndrome where there's too much detail mm -hmm. and there's too much use of the word incredulous. She incredulously tucked her brain. Uh, yeah. We actually really like Wheel of Time, by the way. But yeah, it's, we just it's, like to talk, talk trash about it. But we are just, we're, we're very aware of its, uh, of its flaws. Its flaws. Yeah. Yeah, Malazan just has different different flaws, but its prose is not one of them. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the greatest strengths. I, I remember I remember reading it on my on my uh, my e-reader and like actually stopping and screenshotting groups of paragraphs because they were just so profoundly philosophical within the story that I wanted to I wanted to capture that idea and remember it. Yeah and, and the philosophy of the characters is born out of their setting which is really important. It's not it's not someone waxing poetic about 20th century philosophy or 21st century yeah. philosophy uh, in America or something. No it's 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 quite uh, it's quite unique to to their their viewpoint in the world. Uh, like I said, it opens up with this philosophical statement of you, you know, the the freest life is the one least noticed, and that applies to our lives. But it's really born out of their setting because yeah. these these sort of big paragon characters that are fighting these truly epic struggles um, are the ones who who attract the attention of the gods, and the gods are either allied against them or with them, and. Uh, the gods are playing their own games with mortals, sort yeah. of like a, a harkening back to classical mythology, where you know Jupiter and Hera are making wagers over which hero will be, uh, which hero will be victorious in the war, and so they create a war to fight to have their two favorite people fight each other. Yeah, you know that's like that 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 kind of thematic uh, view of the gods and that the mortals that we mortals are rebelling against the gods that we are against the gods because we have free will we're better than gods in some senses because we have this free will to work against them there's a character in a later book memories of ice which uh, you know it's like every time it's like oh this book we're like oh i love that book yeah. you know they're all good yeah. they're memories all of so good memories of ice is really like the especially the Book two and th memories of ice. I think it's book three. There's book three, yeah. So book two and three are extremely violent and brutal. Yes. So here's your warning: if you're really put off by extreme violence and horror, yeah, it, it, it'll be a turnoff. Yeah, you're not gonna like the series. Just it, you'll yeah. you'll find out really quickly. You you probably won't get past the one of the first scenes where they where uh, what's who's the mage? They're, one of the mages um, gets like blown apart. And he's like, guts are everywhere. And, and he's still talking. And he's, he's still talking. Yeah, it's... Uh, um, <laughs> and, he gets, and then he's, his soul gets it, transferred into a puppy. Yeah, into like this marionette that but just it, walks around. But all of that's important because it, it, 
it, in that first book, you don't realize how he sets up all the systems so that the possibilities for the resolution of the plot in much later books are, are even possible. Yeah, they're even feasible because he set them up that way. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of the mage, but he's such a he's such a bastard. Like, you you really don't like this mage from the beginning, but your first introduction to him is as he's dying, and he's like he's like cursing the the mages around him, like, uh, you know, this mage betrayed us. He 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 destroyed us, and and now we're all we're all gone. But uh, Whiskey Jack is coming, and he's he's going to uh, allow me to transfer my soul into a vessel. Yeah, and so Quick Ben, who's the who's a a really, really fun character comes and does this like ancient magic that yeah. people don't know about. And you, the whole time you're like, you know, quick, quick Ben. Quick Ben's a great, a great example of how you slowly reveal a Paragon-like character. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of Paragon characters, and I, and I'm using that term, not like they're not, they're not like Mary Sue's. They're not like flawless, flawless beings. It's that we meet them along their growth in the story to where they've essentially perfected perfected their competence level. Yeah. They're already they're already as strong as they're gonna get and they're already as competent as they're gonna get. They're not foolish or idiots. Mm-hmm. They don't have they don't fall victim to like uh, limits limitations of their strength that they aren't aware of like a child yeah. learning its its limits. It's not like a it's not like a hero's journey story at all. Yeah. That's one of the things I love about this is that it it's just so Against the grain of what you typically see in a modern fantasy yeah. book, that yeah, it's just completely different. You know, it's completely different in its structure, its approach. There's no hero's journey or anything. It's great. Well, there is hero's journey, but not with every character. That's yeah. that's the thing is uh, these certain characters like Animanda Rake and uh, Quick Ben, they have they have different conflicts. Um, they're not making mistakes because of. Uh, because they need to grow as characters, they're making decisions based on good or bad information that that is really affecting the people around them. Um, and you you really have to have these kind of characters when you're dealing with gods. I mean, yeah, how, else, they, how else could you really the, legitimately have a way to to discuss ascended beings if you didn't also have mortals that were able to to deal with them on their level? Yeah, they were powerful enough. And that's, I don't know, that's a big part of what drew me to the story. Was in order to have this grand, grand conflict, your characters have to be all the more competent mm-hmm. um, in order to execute the plot. Um, and and that, I think that works a lot. Quick Ben is a, is a great character study because he, he, we know that he's pretty strong in like one of the first scenes when he does this ancient magic that people don't know about, like soul transfer, and I don't remember the, the term that the Erickson uses in there, um, but basically can transfer people's soul, souls. Now actually has a big play because as we as we learn more about Quick Ben, we keep getting revealed more and more, and then we finally figure out just just why he knows that magic. Why he knows that magic. Uh, yeah. and Which is a cool reveal. And I don't who think he really it, is. I don't think they reveal that There's, until book six. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty late that they reveal it. Um, but at the end of the first book, you you have Quick Ben, and he just doesn't really do that much. He's just like everyone super respects him. There, he uh, he meets with Shadow Throne, who's a god, and like fools him, fools him, yeah, right? Fools him, yeah. Fools him, and Shadow Throne treats him as a very very familiar yeah. person, a friend. Yeah. And that comes into play later too, <laughs> when you learn who who all these people really are. Yeah. And like it's 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 interesting that he sets he plants the seeds and then you really do harvest them later. Yeah. And, but at the end of the book, he un, he unleashes this power level that you you yeah. realize that it's powerful in the context of that book, but you don't you don't realize how powerful in the until, context yeah, of until, the universe until much later. Until much later, and yeah. it's like. You know, there's basically this godlike ancient being that's been freed and wreaking havoc. Yeah. And Quick Ben just annihilates him. Yeah. He, he's like, Quick Ben opened all seven of his warrens, which no one has that. Yeah. And, no just, one, and people have one access to one warren. He had access to seven. He opened all seven of them and obliterated him. Yeah. Just like that. And that was the end of it. Yeah. And you're just like, <laughs> what? You're like, what? What just <laughs> happened? And then he goes back to just being this normal, soft spoken dude with like yeah. no. No particular 
pretension to greatness or anything yeah. like that. And that also plays into his character and his understanding of the universe. And that very first speech that Whiskey Jack gives to Parrot, where it's yeah. like, the freest life is the one least noticed by the gods. Yeah. Book Ben is playing the game. Yeah. He knows how to play it. Uh, and then later on, you, you kind of figure out why he is the way he is. Yeah. And it's a, it's a pretty cool... It's a pretty cool set of reveals. Well, what, okay, so there's two other characters that I really want to talk about. One of them is Icarium. Icarium yeah. uh, appears in book two. And, and you have this, they have a really good, he can't remember anything. Yeah, so uh, if you ever saw, just, just if you've it. ever seen Memento, yeah. Memento is a great study in kind of what is Icarium. So basically he has, he has no long-term memory. He has no short-term memory. Well, he can't, he, can't, he can't make new memories. And he, he can't, can't remember, make new memories. He can't remember... Yeah. Well, he can't, he can't remember anything about himself from yeah. the past. So, basically, um, every morning he wakes up to to uh, a guy who um, you meet is, is Mappo Runt. Mappo the Trell. And he's a, he's a Trell, which is this kind of ogre-like being. It's a, it's, uh, he's like a giant. Yeah. And he's been his companion for hundreds of years. And every morning he has to he has to tell him who he is, and remind him why they're there. And Ikarium has to kind of come to terms with the fact that he can't remember what he was, but he he does remember that he's on this journey to remember who he was. And you, the the hundreds of thousands of years of this world is kind of told to the reader through Ikarium. Not through Ikarium specifically, but through like flashbacks of Ikarium's life. You know, things um, he did. Yeah, and things he did where they'll come across some ancient thing and he's like, and Ikarium just says, I built this. And Mappo says, this is this is 300,000 years old. And he's like, I remember building this. Why yeah, did I, I build this? Why did I build this machine? Yeah. Like, Ikarium was, was famed in the ancient world for, for building these like incredibly complex machines that people didn't understand the purpose of. Like, and machines that counted time. Yeah. Counted time in minutes and hours like clocks. Mm -hmm. And then on much bigger scales, like hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah. It, it created calendars and things like that. And so there's this interesting juxtaposition between a character who has no memory of time and a character who's who in his past was obsessed with the keeping of time. Yeah. Yeah. And you find out you find out later why he lost his memory, and it's really important why he lost his memory. You figure out later that there's there's a basically an immortal tribunal keeping him from regaining his memory. Because, because he's essentially, so because essentially, if he regained his memory, the world would be destroyed. The world would end um, because he's that powerful. Um, and he does retain memory for a, a small amount of time and that's really important too so he'll he'll remember things for like you know it could be a week it could be a month it could be two or three days uh, but it's never really consistent so he'll wake up and he'll remember that they're doing this specific thing that they're going in this direction and part of Mappo's job is to keep him from remembering yes keep him on uh, yeah, to keep him occupied. So he'll be like, I think we need to go this way. And Matt was like, no, if we go that way, he's going to remember something and that's bad. No, old friend, remember we were we were going this way because you thought this and this. It's yeah, and then, oh. I mean, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but, you know, there's revelations of, of things he did in the past which were quite destructive. Quite put it that destructive. Way. You know, uh, so, and they're, they're trying to keep him from having that same level of destruction. Yeah. Pretty interesting character. And again, one of those, one of those sort of epic level characters. Like you couldn't quite tell an epic story without a character of epic power and, mm -hmm. and um, such strong definition as yeah. as Akarium. Um, some other things that I think are, are cool about the series. There's so many good characters. Yeah. Um, if you like a lot of characters, it's a long series. Yeah. And you it's get a ten, lot of characters. It's ten books, and the books are all pretty long. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of characters, plus. but none of the characters really lack for development as far as, like, the primary plot characters. Yeah. There's there's some um, ascendant characters that you don't get a lot of, and yeah. part of that's by design, because you want 
you want some of these characters to have enigma around them. They're not they're not there for you to discover fully about the world. They're there for you to realize that the world has more depth than you could possibly learn. Uh, a lot like the real world. So um, there's there's certain like draconic gods that that appear throughout the book that you just don't you don't get to learn a lot about, but you know that they're really important and their importance might be revealed to you. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really cool how, how Erickson takes this world, gives you a little bit, and then makes you beg for more. You just beg for more the whole time. Yeah, another another really, um, I think, strong point of the entire series and the, and the setting of the universe is that it is high fantasy, but it really doesn't use any of the of the things that you're probably associated with classic fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, although it's, mm -hmm. I, I consider it like classic in its approach and you know more epic in its scope. But yeah. uh, there's no like elves, yeah. right? There's like no elves and orcs, and so like we're like, oh, it's an ogre-like being. It's like eh, all the races are unique to this they are. particular yeah, universe. They really are. There's there's humans, right? And humans are a diverse set. There's this undead race. Yeah, the Tilanimas. <laughs> the Tilanimas, which are uh, um, basically proto-humans, the cavemen, yeah. that like created this ritual to become immortal to be zombies. Yeah. In order to obliterate another race called the Jaghut. Mm -hmm. And the Jaghut are are an ancient, I guess, troll-like race. Again, yeah, I'm they have, very they have giant things, you know. fangs and they have they have green skin. They're bigger. Um, they're people. they're in they have access to a very specific warren that they're really powerful through. It's an elder warren. Yeah. Um, and then there's what other races? There's uh, well, the... there's there's Karsa Orlong, was who I wanted to talk about. Oh and, yeah. And Karsa Orlong is a is a jag, which is a uh, a mixture of a jag hut. No, no, he's not a jag. He's he's just a uh, he's the other. The jag is a mixture of his of race his race and and the. And the, the I'm trying to remember what he's yeah. called. But he's basically he's, uh, he's a, if if a troll was was a giant, he's like a quadruple giant. He's, yeah, he's huge. He's enormous, and his they're very tribal. And, and like they call people, they call humans children. children. Yeah, and they can just reach down and like crush their skull, and they ride giant horses and stuff. Yeah, like it's really um, it's it's really really cool to have that. And then and I think in the fourth book. House of Chains. It starts mm. off really strong from his perspective, and it, God, it's it's a really, really great little mm. piece of narrative to just introduce keep, you to this entire race yeah, of people and and a really important character and his struggles. He does have a hero's journey. He does, and what's so cool about his hero's journey is at the end, he has the same goal as he set out to have, but for different motivations. Yeah, he's like um, grown in his understanding. Yeah, and he uh, like. I love his character. He's one of my favorite characters. And then we didn't, we're not, I don't think we're going to talk about my favorite character because he's, he's kind of the main character, and, but you don't realize it until like book nine. Yeah. Fiddler. Um, Fiddler. Yeah. Fiddler. Fiddler. Fiddler has his own growth journey and, and he really is like the, he's the regular Joe who makes big who, things happen. Yeah. And, uh, and I like his character a lot. There other races that exist. They have these three different, um, sort of elder races that are are uh, the, the Tiste. Yeah. There's the Tiste Edward, the Tiste Andy, and the Tiste Tiste uh, Leosin. Leosin. Yeah. So the Leosin are like ivory white associated with light. So there's like mm -hmm. the basic ancient ancient orbs. There's like light, mm -hmm. darkness, and then the combination of those two. Shadow. Shadow. So like the Tiste Andy are black, and you you meet them in the first book. Mm -hmm. Then you meet the Tiste Edward. Which are, are shadow. Which are shadow. They're gray, gray thing, and they're mm -hmm. taller than people. And and I always thought of them initially as elves, but then it's not a good yeah. comparison. Yeah. Right. You know, there's no there, there's no elves. These are different races. Entirely. Yeah. And then the 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 Leosin, are, which are they're light, but they're savage. Like yeah, they're really they're really really brutally like xenophobic and yeah hate hate oh. the hate the Tiste and and basically you know you find out why later. And man, the 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 combination of these three races, you you come to understand why they hate each other so much um, through their their associated paragon characters. 
Um, and I love, let's see, I, I think it's Toll of the Hounds, which is book eight. Toll of the Hounds, Toll yeah. Toll of the Hounds, I think is book eight. And some really incredible stuff happens, some really game-changing things happen where you you finally begin to see the materialization of this war between these three races. Um, the the narrative structure, to be honest, is is it feels all over the place until the very end, where you finally start to see these um, these big threads. It's almost as though they're not threads; they're tapestries unto themselves coming together into one mega tapestry. Mega tapestry. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a really interesting work. We're out of time to talk about it. We could make. We, we could, could make like we 10 could, more videos on it if we wanted to, like one on each book. Yeah, they're and, so incredible. And there'd be a lot to talk about um, because of how because of how rich it is. Um, but anyway. 10 out of 10, would recommend. <laughs> yeah, I'd recommend it. Um, it uh, is not, it's not easy reading. It's, yeah, it's not for the, it's not for noobs. Like I, I, um, I mentioned this, I made a video like where to start with fantasy and I said like, this is really good fantasy, but I don't think people should start with it because it's, it's not for noobs. Like you have to, it doesn't doesn't rely on fantasy tropes. It's just it's more dense than than mm. people really want to to do to get into a genre. You know. Yeah, it's not it's not like your light e weekend it's, reading. It's kind of like oh, how do I get into metal? It's like why don't you start with some necrophages? Yeah, it's like, start no. with some emperor, some <laughs> grinding noise metal. It's like <laughs> like what? No, yeah, uh, don't give somebody like, emperor as their first metal CD. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, gonna hate it. <laughs> Let them listen to Metallica. Yeah, give them the Metallica. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you know what, man, Black Album's a great place to start. And mm -hmm. then later, it's like well, I'm looking for the next. Thing. It's like, let me tell you about this band called Winter Sun. Yeah. <laughs> then let me tell you about this band called Twilight Force. Let me tell you about Emperor. <laughs> yeah. So, don't start with it if you've never if you've never read it. If these things sound interesting, put it on your list. Start with some Sanderson. Start with some Jordan. They're going to be much more accessible. Then really dive into Malazan because it's just incredible. Or, or ignore that advice and try it and see. Yeah. <laughs> you might like it. You, you might know. you might be all about it. Because if, if, you're into, if you're into more dense stuff, then you might like it. Or you're wanting just a really epic story. Like, I can't I can't think of a comparably epic story. Maybe Silmarillion, as far as the story, yeah. of the, uh, the, the scope of the story. But Silmarillion's not told in in a narrative structure the way that this one is. So right. uh, if Silmarillion were 10 books, then you'd have something similar to Malazan yeah. Book of Paul. And also, just just as a final aside, uh, Ian Esselmont wrote six books associated with these characters in the Malazan Book of the Fallen series, and they happen intertwined within the main ten book series. And so then Stephen Erickson also wrote, or is in the process of writing, a trilogy prequel based on the Tist Andy and specifically uh, Anamander Rake and another character that you don't meet till much later, Draconis. Yeah. Um, which is really, um, I, I haven't gotten around to it yet because I still, I still kind of have world hangover from the original 10 books. Yeah, there's a lot um, there. There's but, a lot. But we're out of time. You can so, find me at davidvstewart.com, dvspress.com. My main channel is also linked in the description. Uh, and you can find me at matthewjwellman.com. Um, We'll see you guys next time. All right. Later. Later.